Good morning. Today is December 11th, which is one day after the 75th anniversary of the Declaration of Human Rights, which I'm not going to talk about today, but we'll talk about it down the road sometime. But since there are considerable discussions about what international law and domestic law have to say about human rights, I thought I would mention it. The other thing I would like to mention is holidays are upon us. And so the next Ali will, in fact, be on January 8th, right? We're not going to do Christmas, Christmas Day. So what is the topic today? The topic today is Latin America. And you will say, with all the stuff going on, you know, Middle East, Ukraine, etc., why in the world talk about Latin America, which is really not much in the news? You really have to search the news to find anything about Latin America. But nevertheless, I think that uh, we ought to remind ourselves, and given the um, uh, meetings about climate change that have been going on for the last week, uh, we ought to remind ourselves of Latin America, and I think maybe I want to actually um, talk about climate change in Latin America in a minute. But let me say we all sort of learned in school about the Monroe Doctrine, right? The Lat Latin America is in the U.S. sphere of influence. And I suppose I want to exaggerate a little by saying not so much nowadays. So let me start um, talking about this, that, and other issues and places in Latin America. One of the things, of course, everybody's concerned about is energy these days. And that allows one to leap immediately to Venezuela, right? Big source of oil, uh, which we uh, sanctioned and didn't want anything to do with because of the dictatorship in Venezuela. Uh, but now we're sort of beginning to change our mind, oil companies, etc. But of more immediate interest in some ways is the fact that Venezuela, trying to divert attention from itself, uh, is now claiming a portion of the land of Guyana. If you want to look at a map sometime, it's right next door. And the borders of Guyana go back until the late 19th century. Uh, I, I'm sorry, yes, 19th century, 18 something or rather, um, where the, the you know the borders of Venezuela and Guyana were um, were discovered. But why is uh, Venezuela interested in now battling Guyana over where the actual borders are? And that is because a major oil source has been discovered in Guyana, uh, which would make Guyana quite rich if they drew the oil out of the land. And Venezuela, A, uh, could probably profit from having more oil in the ground if it captured some of the territory of Guyana. But more importantly, I think uh, Venezuela is trying to uh, divert attention from its own terrible politics. So there is an environmental issue. There is a political issue as to where territory uh, might be. Uh, and obviously there'll be an international issue, perhaps even at the UN about the borderlines of Guyana. Uh, is Venezuela gonna to go to war with Guyana? Probably not. But in any event, there is a brewing conflict there. Now, what are the reasons that Venezuela is trying to divert attention from itself is not just because of its middle, miserable uh, politics. Madero has been the dictator since 2013. Um, but also because uh, Venezuelans are leaving Venezuela in droves, and that is having an impact on American immigration policy. And it may come as a surprise for you who don't follow 
the makeup of U.S. immigration, or at least on the border, the immigration situation, is that uh, in the most recent month or two, the largest numbers of people trying to cross into the United States in the southern border have not been what many people think Mexicans and Central Americans, but rather Venezuelans and Haitians. The Venezuelans have been leaving in droves for some years, but they went to Colombia and other places, uh, which can't handle any more um, uh, asylum seekers. And so now Venezuelans are showing up at our doorstep. So the situation, the domestic situation in Venezuela is and ought to be of two kinds of interest to the U.S. One is a potential com border conflict in um, Latin America, but more to the point, uh, the uh, influx of Venezuelans who simply don't have enough to eat, can't see any future in coming to the U.S. And I think many Americans have a very distorted picture of who the folks are uh, or the majority of the folks are that are currently on the U.S. border. And I said they're Venezuelans and Haitians. So presumably we have an interest in that matter as well as the oil and the border matter. Now that leads to some extent immediately to Brazil, which as you know, is the largest country in Latin America. And Brazil also has a slight border issue with Guyana and Venezuela and the oil. So it has its finger in that situation, although not its entire hand. Um, but why is Brazil important? Why should the U.S., why should we as citizens care about Brazil? Well, we should care about Brazil because 40% of the forests, the rainforests in the world are located in Brazil. And 20% or close to 20% of the rainforest have already vanished. In other words, it used to be 60%. It's now only 40%. And the previous head of state of um, Brazil, who was a kind of Trump figure, um, was happy to sell off the rainforest land to farmers uh, and industries and didn't care at all for the importance of the rainforest and the maintain maintenance of the rainforest, not just to Brazil, but to the world. So the climate change issue is much, and what to do about it and how to preserve the remaining rainforest is very central to Brazil. So even if we weren't interested in Latin America and one was interested in climate change, Brazil would leap to mind and would be a very important component because of course uh, the rainforest absorbs CO2 and uh, so forth. Um, there's one other thing to be said about the climate issue in Brazil, and that is much of the land that uh, the previous uh, president of Brazil uh, allowed uh, to be bought up and used by farmers, much of that land was used for soybean production. And soybean production, amongst other things, produces methane gas. And the soya beans largely were exported to China. And I'll get to, back to China in a minute. So while the Brazilian government, certainly in Lulu's hand, right, who is left of center, is trying to restore some sanity to both national and international policies, which matter in terms, particularly in terms of climate change, but also, of course, to the people of Brazil, uh, reversing the problem and making sure that more land is not sold off for farming and is maintained as tropical rainforest is really very important. And it's not easy to manage from the center of the Brazilian government because some of that land is really belongs to provinces, to local political units, and to persuade them to stop selling the land for farming purposes is also very, very difficult. Um, then um, when, when looking at Latin America, 
Uh, there are natural resources issues, not just in Brazil, but in many of the Latin American countries. Uh, for example, lithium, for example, copper. Uh, what, why should we as Americans care about that? Well, we care about those resources and who gets them and who doesn't get them, because amongst other things, we are in competition with the Chinese and others for access to these metals, which are very important for batteries and for electrification of cars and so on. I'm sure you read about those. But um, there are very min many mineral uh, uh, lodged under the ground in various parts of Latin America. And while we have not uh, particularly uh, gotten involved in mining or concern about when these uh, resources will be mined, uh, some others have interested themselves in the matter. And the key other happens to be China. So while we claim that um, uh, Latin America is our sphere of interest. China has been very busy making alliances with various Latin American countries where minerals are located and helping some of those governments also invest in infrastructure and other things so as to be good, on good terms with Latin America. So uh, while we're not looking or while we're paying attention to other things, China has actually been very busy trying to capture good relations with various Latin American countries and getting access to the mineral resources and making deals with Latin American countries. So if we're interested, which we seemingly are, in competing influence of the United States and China, hello, here we are, in Latin America, which we say is our sphere of interest. And in point of fact, Ch China over the recent years has made a big attempt to have influence in Latin American countries where the various minerals are, are uh, located, making deals with them, getting on good terms with the governments. And in, in point of fact, counting Latin America as one of China's sphere of influence uh, from the perspective of economic relations. And once you uh, make deals with governments and have economic relations with them, you might actually also have some influence on the governments and their policies and other, in other areas. So now I've highlighted two issues, environmental issues in Brazil and to some extent other countries, uh, but also uh, economic interests. And part of our sphere of influence, Monroe Doctrine and so forth, was mainly intended for you know, military and political interests. I mean, nobody should dare to get themselves involved in Latin America because that was our backyard and we will be monitoring it. Well, meantime, of course, Many of countries have relations with each other which are not military in nature, which are economic in nature, and, and therefore are able to influence uh, a variety of things, um, votes in the United Nations, uh, trade of various kinds, investments of various kinds. So if one looks at Latin America right now, one would say that a major, more recent influence in Latin America, while we're not looking and paying much attention, is in fact, is in fact uh, China. So bef let me drop that for a minute and say what has been another country that has come to recent attention and you might have seen in the news, and that is Argentina, uh, where they have just elected a uh, cuckoo bird. Uh, how is he described? He's described as an arco libertarian. Uh, he is, is, a, is a trained economist, but also a TV host. In other words, another sort of who the, in the world would think this person would become head of state, sort of in the realm of a of a of a Trump. 
So what about Argentina? Well, Argentina currently has 200% inflation. I think a week ago it was 140% inflation. So Mr. Milley comes in, uh, or at least becomes a political contender at first, <clears throat> and his opposition is sort of from the mainstream government, which is held responsible by Argentinians uh, to have uh, led to and contributed to and not prevented the incredible economic disarray of Argentina. And so somebody comes along and says, I can fix this. I know how to fix it. Well, how does he want to fix it, he said during his campaign. Well, get rid of the central bank, get rid of the Argentinian currency and substitute the U.S. dollar, uh, do this, that, and the other thing, get rid of some departments of government. Um, then, of course, there are the social issues, you know, ban gay rights, transgendered rights, uh, do all kinds of sort of right-wing conservative social things. Um, and, um, you know, he's going to set things right. Oddly enough, he was anointed as president yesterday. And during his speech and press conferences, he seemed to back off some of his uh, most radical claims. To begin with, he appointed some people from the previous government who are not, you know, libertarian uh, cuckoo birds. Uh, he said that, yes, the central bank need to be gotten rid of, but it would take a little time. Uh, he even managed to say that converting the, the Argentinian currency to now use the U.S. dollar, that would also take some time. So he has stepped back from the economic and politically most radical things that he said during his election. Now, will he step back? Will he create this array? Will some center reasonable policies be instituted? Your guess is as good as mine because this is all new in terms of the election and then what he had to say had to say yesterday. But what it does prove is the frustration of people in many parts of the world, including the United States, with what they perceive to be economic problems um, in Argentina, for sure, in the U.S., uh, not exactly what uh, right-wing Republicans claim. The economy, in many ways, is in reasonable shape in the United States. But in any event, um, the public is either feels or is led to feel that the mainstream politicians, right of center, left of center, are absolutely useless. They're no good. They bring us none of the our desired quality of life. And then somebody comes along who is quite crazy uh, in terms of their claims of what they want to do and what they can do. And they say, well, let's give him or her a chance. That creates um, possible solutions, but it also creates instability. So now you have you know, dictatorships in various Latin American countries including Venezuela and including Argentina. Uh, and if he makes good on some of his, his uh, claims. And um, it is destabilizing uh, politically, economically, climatologically, in terms of human rights and, and so forth. So Argentina is in a new um, order now. A page has been turned, and since Argentina has been historically one of the more important Latin American countries, economically and uh, in every, politically in every other way, um, it's not some trivial little backwater country. It matters to the U.S., and of course nowadays it always matters to China, which has made various investments in businesses, not just in mining, in Argentina to get its foot into the door uh, of that particular country. So as I'm skipping around, let me skip to our, uh, Chile, another important country. Uh, you will recall uh, many moons ago 
that uh, we helped ouster a left of center, quote unquote, socialist president of Argentina. That brought the military into, I'm sorry, in, in uh, Chile. That brought the military for years in uh, leadership in Chile. Uh, in more recent years, they've had democratic elections. Uh, and the most recent election in Chile produced a left of center person whose name is Gabriel Boric. Uh, he's quite young, uh, I think in his 30s still. Uh, he used to say that he was a Marxist, but he's certainly left of center. And he is trying to cope in Chile, which has all kinds of economic and social problems as well with education and so forth. But so far, uh, Chile, which is another of the important uh, Latin American country uh, has a very left of center government trying to cope with um, international dynamics, uh, international economics, and its domestic domestic scene. Uh, there's no reason to believe right now that Chile is unstable, but it's a question of watch and see of this particular government. What can it do? How will the Chileans feel about it? Um, it um, many internal changes are taking place uh, that are quote unquote socialist in nature, reviving uh, social benefits and, and so on. So without boring you with the details of all of that, Chile is a kind of watch and see left of center rather than right of center cuckoo bird or uh, you know dictatorship uh, of the kind that you have in Venezuela and some other countries. Now, you know, I could run through all the rest of the country on, on the countries. Uh, there are too many to deal with in any depth. But suffice it to say that countries like Bolivia, Ecuador, Peru, some of you may have actually visited Peru and gone to Machu Picchu, all have had unstable politics in recent years. Uh, dictators have been thrown out, uh, right of center, left of center. Uh, people uh, have been... Um, in uh, in Bolivia, for example, uh, the, a dictator was thrown out. A person took over for him. Uh, she was she is now in jail, and another person is in power. Uh, Peru and Ecuador have had all kinds of um, all kinds of turnover. In fact, in Ecuador, you have a very young chap who's just taken uh, taken over. Um, so nothing is very stable in the politics of most Latin American countries for, for the time being. Uh, in most cases, people, unlike Venezuelans, aren't fleeing, but their politics are not stable and the discovery of their natural resources, uh, has spurned uh, and developed a keen interest on the part of China and some other countries, but China most importantly, of saying here is an unexplored uh, continent in some ways that has resources that, you know, years ago people weren't that keen or interested in lithium, but now it's an important part of our battery development. And so China has edged itself as an important actor, economic actor, but some, to some extent also an actor with some political clout and influence on the heads of state of Latin America. Meantime, back at the farm, we continue to be largely disinterested in Latin America. Uh, by we, I mean uh, the press it doesn't pay much attention. They're obviously busy with both domestic and Middle East and Ukrainian issues. Uh, there, it, we are interested in China, but we, I think mo hardly anybody who has, is in the U.S. government has spoken up uh, or has it become an agenda item in the presidency uh, that Latin America uh, or the the uh, arrival in some ways and participation in Latin America of China is of any interest or concern, even though we keep on saying we're interested in the spread of Chinese influence in various places. 
Um, and uh, China is uh, smartly diversifying in Latin America. That is to say, it is also trading. Uh, I gave the example of uh, uh, soya beans, but there are other products. So China is has a way of saying to countries, yes, we're interested in your minerals, but we're also develop interesting, interested in developing trade and investment in businesses and so forth. Now, is this necessarily bad? I mean, from the perspective of Latin America, given how little interest and attention the U.S. pays, it's not bad. I mean, some many Latin American governments will benefit from the Chinese interest in them. Uh, but from the perspective of the U.S. saying, you know, we are the ones controlling our backyard uh, and we are, uh, you know, this is our sphere of influence. I want to say to us as citizens, as well as to the U.S. government, maybe you should take a little further note of what is actually going on economically. Um, and environmentally in Latin America, because both environment and climate change matters. Uh, then secondly, going back to the beginning, um, it is of interest, not just that when the economic situation in Central America or Mexico is very bad, that people will come, try to enter the U.S., but nowadays, as I said, Venezuelans are arriving in large numbers. And Haiti, which is a total disaster area, which I'm not talking about today, is also increasing people. And finally, um, there are um, ways in which people from around the world, be they Chinese who are fed up with China, or people who are upwardly mobile or in disarray in various parts of Asia, are also who also try to come to the U.S. and also are arriving in Mexico on the U.S. on the U.S. border. Now, don't misunderstand me. I am not anti-immigration. I am in favor of the U.S. having capacity to process asylum seekers more effectively and creating a, 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 a reasonable process for allowing people in. But the U.S. certainly needs immigrants and certainly can use the Venezuelans and others uh, because we need uh, more immigrants for our domestic labor purposes, uh, if nothing else. But it is noticeable that what we used to think of as immigration uh, coming mainly from Central America and Mexico, and by the way, relatively little comes from Mexico nowadays, because generally speaking, if things aren't too bad at home, you might as well stay home. But things are quite bad in many parts of the world, and uh, that therefore uh, we should not be surprised that when in our brains the people that are coming are coming from Mexico, when in fact at the moment the largest numbers come from Venezuela and 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 Mexico. Uh, what sort of is my thesis here? My thesis is that we've neglected Latin America for many many ways, very very frequently in American history. And I think through the last few presidencies, other than, you know, concern about the oil relationship with Venezuela and a few other things here and there, we've essentially paid relatively little attention, either as citizens or as government, to various Latin American countries. Meantime, underneath our lack of attention, the big issues nowadays, such as climate change, such as instability, such as our competition with China, has gotten essentially unnoticed with respect to uh, Latin America. And it would be useful if we had the bandwidth in our policymaking uh, as well as citizens, that we pay some more attention to Latin America, not necessarily because we oppose what's going on, but at least to know what's going on and to be able to define and refine U.S. national interest in Latin America, which I my thesis this morning has been, which has been waning for many years. 
So let's see whether or not we can pay a little bit more attention to Latin America. I wish you all very good holidays, and I look forward to getting back to talking about the Middle East and other things in the new year. Thank you very much.